35 years to find out. Eat your heart out. All right, I want you to go to 2 Kings chapter 7. 2 Kings chapter 7. And in 2 Kings chapter 7, uh, Israel, Jerusalem is surrounded. Uh, The Syrians have got them. They're boxed in. And look what it says in verse 3. And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? Now, I'm sure some of you preachers have preached from that text. Um, But it says, Why sit we here until we die? I'm going to tell you something. Have you ever been around lepers? That is a... that is a uh, uncomforting thing. Uh, back in 1990, I was preaching this little island in the South Pacific by the name of Koh Sri Micronesia. The pastor there had been one of my students years earlier in a Bible college I taught at in Ohio. And, and I like people. I really do. So after the service, I'm shaking this guy's hand, shaking this guy's hand, shaking this guy's hand. And he goes, oh, you see that guy right there? Yeah, that's, uh, that's Pastor Luther. He was a native. And he said, uh, he's kind of my deacon. He's my number two man. He's right there for me. Oh, okay. And he says, now you see that guy right there, the tall fellow? Yeah, I remember shaking his hand. Yeah, that's Moses. That was this guy's name. Uh, the island had been, had been uh, occupied by the Japanese in World War II. And he said he was just a little boy when they occupied the, the island. He could still tell you stories about it. And he said, you see that woman right there? So, yeah, I remember shaking her hand. He goes, she's our leper. Oh, oh. Do you know how you feel when you just found out you already shook the hand of a leper? So here you got these four lepers, and look what they say. Why sit here till we die? If we say we, uh, we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we die also. Now therefore come and let us fall under the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. And you know the story. They went to the, the, the Syrian camp. The Lord had made the, the Syrians hear like an enemy, enemy army coming, and they took off. And can you see these four guys just going through the Syrian camp? And I can just see them with chains and everything else. And, and they're just having a good time, eating everything they can. Go, but look what they said. They said, um, look at verse 9. Then they said one to another, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings. And we hold our peace if we carry to the morning light. Some mischief will come upon us. Now, therefore, come that we may go and tell the king's household. And they went in and told the king that the Syrian army's gone. Uh, the siege was broken. Uh, and, the, and the famine in the city ended because of these four lepers. Now, now here you got, you got Jonathan, who was a noble and courageous warrior. You have this widow lady who's figuring she's going to die when she makes her last meal. You got four lepers. Is there anybody here who would like to be compared to any leper? I wouldn't want to be compared to a leper, but we got two more. I want to go to Jeremiah chapter 38. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 38. And I'm not really going to show you anything here. I just want to see if you have that chapter in your version. Jeremiah chapter 38. And what's happened here is Jeremiah. Is uh, he's kind of he's, he's on the outs. We are moving in that direction in this country where Christians, you know, if you guys, if you can't figure out why the news media backs Islam, it's because they both hate the same two groups, Christians and Jews. Okay, and uh, and as far as the country, they both hate America. And so Jeremiah has been he has been lowered into a into a pit down into the mire. He might be knee deep. And who shows up but this uh, slave, Ebedmelech? Look at verse 8. Well, let's look at verse 7. Now, when Ebedmelech, the Ethiopian, one of the eunuchs which was in the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon, the king then sitting in the gate of Benjamin, Ebedmelech went forth out of the king's house and spake to the king, saying, My lord, the king. These men have done evil in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they have cast into the dungeon, and he is like to die for hunger in the place uh, where he is, for there is no more bread in the city. Then the king abandoned, uh, commanded ebed the Ethiopian, saying, Take from thence thirty men with thee, and take up Jeremiah the prophet out of the, out of the dungeon before he died. So ebed took the men with him, 
and went into the house of the king under the treasury uh, and took thence old cast clouts and old rotten rags uh, and let them down by cords into the dungeon to Jeremiah. And Abed- 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 the Ethiopian said to, unto Jeremiah, Put now these old cast clouts and rotten rags under thine armholes, uh, under the cords, and Jeremiah did so. So they drew up Jeremiah with cords and took him up out of the dungeon, and Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. So you've got this brave soldier by the name of Jonathan, and he has something in common with this widow lady who has got just a little bit of meal, a little bit of oil, and she's going to die. And he's, they've got something in common with these four lepers, and they've got something in common with a slave. And they have something in common. Look at Daniel chapter 3. And then we will give you the message, and that'll be that. Daniel chapter 3, we know the story. You know the story. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar sets up an uh, image. He tells everybody, when you hear the rock and roll, let's see the layers of lights. You're supposed to have the worship service and the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the worship team. I didn't even know worship was a team sport. And these guys refused to do it. And he says this, um, look at verse 15. Now, if you be ready, uh, that it, uh, Dan, Dan chapter 3, verse 15, now, if you be ready, that at uh, what time you hear the sound of cornet, flute, harp, sax butt, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, and the laser lights, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if you worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. This was where he made his real mistake. And who is the God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. When they say that we're not careful, that means we're not worried about what we're going to tell you. I mean, look, if somebody says I'm about to tell you, what are you going to say? I mean, it's like, will they kill you faster? You know, we don't want to make you mad. You know, we're going to kill you. They said, look, we're not even careful. Look what they said. Verse 17. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fire of furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. I like this verse, verse even better. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. you got this brave soldier. You've got this widow. You've got four lepers. You've got this slave. And you got three little kids, little children, and they are standing by the side. What do they have in common? Let's have a word of prayer. Father, these folks came to church. I know what they want. They want something from you. And they want something from your book. And if they don't get it tonight, it will be my fault. So what they really need tonight is they need you to get Sam Gift out of their way and out of your way. God, my prayer is that you'll just get Gip out of the way, that you will speak to the heart of somebody here, and you accomplish your purpose in each life represented, God, that these folks in some way tonight would be edified, and then they being edified, they would leave here. Because if they're edified, God, they will leave here and live to your glory. And I pray, God, that we would have the same common denominator that these five groups that we looked at tonight. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Um, the Christian what? Character. You know, if you have all this diverse, I say it properly again, if you have all this diverse crowd, everything from electrons to, um, electricians to uh, painters to carpenters to mechanics to brain surgeons, the common denominator is Jesus Christ, correct? You know what all of these, Jonathan, this widow, these lepers, this slave, these three children, you know what they all have? They have one thing in common. They have character. They all had a form of character. Guys, I am sorry. You understand this? That getting saved, when you get saved, that does not automatically instill character in you. You know, uh, I tell people when I got saved, I was, a, I was 20 years old, I was a Roman Catholic, I was a drunk, I was a thief, I was a Democrat. You know, all those ungodly things, you know. And uh, But you know, in my generation, what you did when you got saved is you cut your hair, you changed your clothes, you went to church, you fit right in. Man, now when they get saved, they got like yo-yos in their earlobes. 
they got, they got horns drilled into their heads. They've got tattoos all over them. They don't know how many states there are. They don't know any history of this country. They cannot spell. They can't write cursive. All right, so when they get, and, and they don't believe in working. Isn't that true? I got news for you. When they get saved, it does not instill character. That just means they're not going to hell. And that's a wonderful thing. But you still got people. Some of you, you lead them to Christ. You can't understand why, why back in the 70s when somebody got saved, they got in and got busy. Now you lead somebody that same age uh, today and, and they never get busy because they don't have character. And it is character that is what it was, Christian character that forged America. That is true. And these five examples are examples of people who had character. And even though the circumstances are different, even though they, they, there is no comparison between any of them, they're, none of them are the same, if they were all alive at the same time, you wouldn't have those lepers talking to that king. You wouldn't have that widow knowing who the... She'd be out there uh, at a slave, you understand? But they had character. And guys, when, when, somebody, when people have character, it shows. You know what you can't do? You can't hide character. You cannot hide character. It is not a case of not knowing what to do. All of us know what to do. You know, uh, I, I say this. Any two men in this room could take care, I'll bet you any two men in this room could sit down and say, here's what our country needs to do, and this will restore our nation. Isn't that true? Let me ask you something, guys. If two guys in here can figure it out in a half an hour, how come 535 of them can't figure it out? And please never call Congress stupid. Please never, ever call them stupid. No, 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 they're not stupid. Nobody can be stupid like that. Well, I mean, really, think about this. Look, if you, if you were in Congress and you had 50 laws to vote in and nobody told you what they said, they just gave you 1 through 50 and put yes or no. You don't even know what you're voting in. And you just said, okay, I'll just go down there and go, uh, yes, yes, no, 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 yes, no, 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 yes, 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 no, no. Now, you don't even know what you said, yes. Are you totally ignorant of what you're voting for? But in your ignorance, wouldn't you vote something good in? I mean, in ignorance, if you're dumb... You're going to vote something bad in, but you're going to vote something good in by accident. And if it's 99% of the time bad, that's not an accident. But they know what to do. You say, what's the problem? It is the lack of character. You have people in your churches. They know exactly what they need to do. They, have, they are facing spiritual problems, and they come into you, and you tell them exactly what they need to do, and you know what they do? They don't. They just go off their own direction. You know why? Because they don't have character. Guys, when somebody has character, it shows. And here's what these all had in common as far as this character. First off, all of them got involved. Jonathan, could, he said, I just can't sit here. If we're going to fight, let's go fight. If we're not going to fight, then let's go home. But I, I, we got to do something. You ever felt that way? Let's do something. I can't stand sitting around. Let's get something rolling. That was Jonathan. His character would not allow him. He's got a whole army around him. He didn't even get the army involved. Because he knew what he was going to do it might cost him his life. And as much as that armor bearer, you might have said he was a victim. No, he knew that armor bearer would be right beside him and would die right beside him. He knew his armor bearer was with him like his own heart. He said, yes, what I'm going to do might cost me my life. And it might cost my armor bearer's life. But I'm not going to put my army uh, at, at risk. But I just can't sit here. I have got to get involved. Isn't it what that widow woman said? Wouldn't it have been in her? And could anybody complain if she had said to this strange man, I'm sorry, Doc, but I've only, I said I got only a little bit of meal, and I've only got a little bit of oil, and me and my son are going to eat it. We're not giving, don't you understand? You need to probably help me more than I need to help you. And yet she still got involved, didn't she? And she got involved at her own cost. What about the lepers? What they say? We're going to sit here till we die. He said, if we sit here, if we go to Jerusalem, they're probably going to kill us. And if we sit here, we're going to die. And if we go to the Syrians, they're probably going to kill us. I just want to die. So let's just, let's everybody run in and hug a Syrian. <laughs> Buddy, I guarantee you, a Syrian would hug you. You would find out what your hot water heater was set at. I would scald the skin off my body if a leper hugged me. But you see, they couldn't just sit there. 
You say, what was it? It was character. See, we think a widow can't have character. Oh, yeah, that Jonathan would have character? That makes sense to us. That this widow woman would have character? That doesn't make sense to us. That these four lepers would have character? That doesn't make sense to us. But they all had character. What about this, this, uh, this slave? Where were the other men of God? Weren't there some other prophets hanging around about that time? Why weren't they going to the king and petitioning something for Jeremiah's safety? Because they're afraid they'd end up in the same slime hole with him. So they just said this. We'll pray about it. Guys, I believe in prayer. I really do. But I tell folks, I said, sometimes you need to write your prayer request in the back of a check for about 250 bucks. I'm, I'm sorry, but sometimes I'll pray about it exempts us from ever having to do anything. You know what you should do, and you don't want to do it because you don't want it to cost you anything, so you sound spirit. Well, we'll just pray about it. So they're out praying. You know what the slave said? I can handle this. I couldn't sleep last night. All I can think about is that man of God down that hole. Now, I don't know where them other Baptist preachers are. They're, they're doing something. They're having a dinner on the ground eating fried chicken. I'm going to do something about this. Let me ask you a question. Could that king not have said, who do you think you are? You aren't even in my court. You aren't even royal. You walk in. You are the guy that serves me my coffee and you're going to come and get in my face. I'm the king. You are going down. I'm not even going to put you in here. I will take your head off. But he couldn't hold back. He didn't care what happened to him. You know why? Because character always gets involved. Character cannot sit silently and see injustice. Character cannot sit back and allow wrong to go unrighted. And maybe character, some of the character, maybe they will not, maybe they will not be able to right the wrong, but they're going to die trying. They're going to get into this, okay? And how about these three kids? Didn't they, didn't they know what to do? You know, I hate to say this, guys, I really do. Uh, now, I wasn't, I wasn't saved in 1962. I was just a kid in school. Uh, and they got rid of prayer. He couldn't talk about God anymore. And I was saved in 1973, but I had nothing to do with it when they, when they did this abortion thing. But here's what I see sometimes. You know, we always say, oh, the devil took this from us. I'm not sure the devil takes much from us. Here's what the devil does. He walks up and he says, I want, that, I want this land you're standing on. Well, oh, no. God gave me this land. This is my land. I said, I want it. Now, get off. I want the land you're on. Oh, this isn't fair. No, you can't have that land. God gave me that land. And then we step off of it and give it to him and say, just see how the devil took that from me. God, guys, the devil didn't take half of the stuff from us. We sat there and let it happen. You say, why? Because somebody at some time was lacking some character. See, here's our problem. I'll tell you how you can tell you have no character. Whenever you know what you ought to do, and instead of doing it, you start counting what it's going to cost you if you do it. Well, I'm just, uh, you know, this, I'm sorry, you 30-something guys? You know what your cell phone has done to you? It has taken any, ever, any individuality you ever could possibly have out of your life. You know what you guys do? You want to see some movie where it's, uh, well, I don't know who it is now. It used to be John Wayne or Stallone or uh, Schwarzenegger. Now it is... Uh, Matt Damon and Tom Cruise or whatever. And here's what you like. The whole world's going this direction. But my hero, he's always gone against the grain. You'll watch movies like that all day long. You would want to be that guy to save your life. You, I honest, a 30-something had to buy new glasses, and he posted on the Internet, I have to get new glasses. I posted four different pictures of me in four different frames because you tell me what I look best in. Now, you know what I, when I see that, you know what I think? How is this guy going to make a decision for God that's life or death? You can't pick out glasses without being afraid. Some of you go, well, who picked those out for you, your mom? Oh, I knew I should have asked everybody. <laughs> Here's how the 30-something is. Okay, guys, I have a big, I have a big decision coming up. I, I need some help here. Tell me, you guys know what I should do. Okay, Whew. just in time. Okay. I'll have the caramel macchiato.
you know, I got a, I got a, I got a, a YouTube page, you know, and I, and I, and I put on these uh, videos, and I get a 30-something guy, and I love him, but he says, now look what you can do. And, he's, and he goes into the analytics, and he shows me how many people watch that week, and how many new viewers, and what countries are from, and, and, and he goes, you ever look at this? I go, no. Well, aren't you interested? I said, no. I don't care. I really don't care. Guys, I, I was saying something the other day. If, if the two words, unfollow or unfriend, terrify you, get a like. You got unfriended by somebody you don't even know, and it broke your heart. It traumatized. I had three people unfollow me today. Well, who were they? I don't even know. But I'll, I'll never say any. Guys, why would you knock a politician when your phone has made you one? You're afraid to do what you know. You say, Listen, nobody in here is confused. There's no fog in your head. You know what is right. You know what you should do. And then you run the analytics. Then you send a letter all over the country saying, let's come and stand side by side. Yeah, you gutless thing. You can't stand for God by yourself. You've got to have somebody hold your hand. That's not character. This, this widow didn't say, oh, I don't have anything, but I know somebody's got something, they'll bring you some food. No, 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 these people didn't see anybody else. Seek anybody else. They just said, I can't take this anymore. I'm going to do something about it. Character has to get involved. Is that not what happened to those men? Taxi. I was so, so funny. We have a... We have a, a, a good brother, fellow evangelist in our church. He came from New Hampshire to Idaho. It was traumatic for him. You know what it says on the bottom of New Hampshire license plate? Live free or die. He said, do you have any idea what it feels like to come from live free or die to famous potatoes? But, but see, he's saying that New Hampshire, live free or die, represents New Hampshire. Famous potatoes, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, that kind of describes Idaho. But I was walking across the Capitol today, and I saw a vehicle with a Washington, D.C. plate that said, taxation without representation. I thought, well, they finally got that one right. You know, I come from taxation without representation. That was the problem. You understand some of those men? lost their lives or lost their fortunes in the war that, that birthed this, this nation and gave us our freedom? See, that's the whole problem. When you don't have character, you should think about, if I do this, what's it going to cost me? If you have character, you say, this needs done, I'm going to do it, I don't care what happens to me. When you find yourself, before you act, before you do what you know you should do, when you find yourself figuring all out well, this is going to cost us here, and this is going to cost us... Oh, and this will cost me something here. No, no wonder you want somebody else to come stand with you. No wonder you're crying to everybody saying, please come and help me. you got no character, and you're hoping one of your friends has some, and they'll show up. Character always gets involved. Character does not think of itself. Every single one of the groups that I told you about, couldn't they all have had a good excuse we're sitting and doing nothing. Couldn't Jonathan have said, well, you know, I'm subordinate to my dad. He hasn't said attack. He said, listen, we're going we're to wait. So, you know, I, not my fault. Couldn't that widow woman have said, I don't care, pal, who told you to come? I don't have enough food for you. Couldn't he have said, she have said that? Couldn't those four lepers said this? Why should we do anything for them? Anytime we get near the city, they throw rocks at us. And they call us names. What do we owe them? We're not getting involved in this. It's their war. We're going to die anyway. Whether they, if they said, if the Syrians don't kill us, they'll kill us. If they don't kill us, we'll just die because they threw us out of their city. Let them starve. Let the Syrians overrun the place. They did not think of themselves. How about that slave? You, we heard this week about Esther going into the king. She put her life on the line, did she not? You think that slave didn't put his on the line? 
Do you think that king couldn't have taken his head off at the time? you think he couldn't have been in a dungeon, never feed him again, let him die a slow death? Couldn't he torture him to death? Couldn't he cut his head off? He could have done any number of things. He didn't care. He said, that man of God needs to be taken care of. And what about those three Hebrew kids? Three, three Hebrew kids. Don't you think they could have said, well, this isn't our war. The king said, we're supposed to bow, and we're supposed to obey the king. So we're just going to bow. I mean, there's no man of God standing up for us. We, we're not the ones that are supposed to take care of it. Character is not think of itself. You, if there's anything wrong with us, it is that we always ponder the cost. You know, somebody asked me some time ago, what was the difference between Christianity now and in the 70s? The 1970s. Anyway, um, and I said, here was the difference. I said, back in the 70s, the lost world thought that they were on this earth to enjoy life the best way they could. And Christians thought they were on this earth to serve God. And if somebody was saved and not serving God, they at least knew that they should. Do you understand? Today, the lost world still thinks it's here to serve, uh, to enjoy life. But now Christians have been convinced of it. Now, I'm going I'm to tell you one of the most wicked movies that was ever made, and there is no sex in it, and there is no violence in it, because you think if there's sex and violence, it's bad, and if there's no sex and violence, it's okay. This movie had no sex in it, had no violence, and I've not even seen it, but I saw portions of it, and it has inflicted and affected every Christian I have ever met. You know what it's, you know it's called? The Bucket List. It's about two guys who are going to die of cancer, and they got this bucket list, all these things they want to do before they die. And so they're just spending the rest of their, life, their dying days trying to accomplish this and trying to see this and try to do that. And now I go into churches and I hear some stupid, TV-educated, mouth-breathing Christian say, yeah, I want to see that place. That's on my bucket list. I never found anybody had a bucket list before that movie came out. And I've never found a Christian yet with a bucket list that something in the bucket was, I'm hoping to win X number of people before the Lord comes. I want to read my Bible this many times. I want to bring this many people to church. You know, the, the, the bucket list is always, I want to see the Grand Canyon. And I, I saw this thing on the internet, and it said some bozo in a swing above clouds, and it said, swing above the clouds in church. And so, I imitated my children when they were six. And I just put one word. Why? If there is somebody, if you have been, somebody's out there right now going, oh man, I went to church just like a street bar cop. I can't tell anybody now. We now think we're here to enjoy life. And you're not going to do I didn't say be tortured for Christ. I didn't say you're going to lose your job. I didn't say they're going to cut off your head. You're just scared it's going to be uncomfortable. You know, two words that, it, that, that, that were used to describe our Savior are despised and rejected. And we never want those two words to be used to describe accurately us. So we count the cost. And everything we do, if we're going to do it, the first thing we do is we count what's it going to cost me. If any, do you understand this? If any one of these, in these five situations, if any of them have said, what's it going to cost me? Do you understand how differently your Bible would be written right now? military victories wouldn't have been accomplished. A prophet would have died. Two prophets might have died. An entire city might have been wiped out. A nation would have been conquered. Is that not true? And God would have been dishonored. They never thought of themselves. I'm going to tell you, pal, if you're thinking about yourself, don't even pretend you have character. Because you don't. I'll tell you something else about character. Every one of these did something that was, and here's the word, indispensable. You know what indispensable is? It could not have gone on unless this had happened. Jonathan won. He, listen, his action, you say, it brought a great military victory. No, it didn't. It brought two of them. Jonathan's action brought two great military victories a couple of thousand years apart. We see, Jonathan, you know the story. They went up there, and they said, uh, Hey, you! Fill the 
Philistine! And the Philistine looked over there. What? No, not you, lady. I'm talking to your son. Is he up there? <laughs> Who do you think you are? Hey, lady. Kind of sound like my mother-in-law. Could you just go get a man for me? I'd like to talk to a real man. You come up here, we'll show you a thing. And Jonathan looked at the and says, There are. And they went up there. There's a little piece of ground, about half an acre of ground. They slew those guys, and a great victory happened. Here's what you don't, may not know. 1970, 1917, World War I, the British were facing the Turks. They had to attack. Tomorrow they're going to attack the Turks across this valley, this valley, the valley where First where, where Samuel was. And they're going under straight into Turkish artillery, and they are going to be slain. But there was a British major. I can't remember his last name. I don't know why. I wish I could. His first name is Vivian. Who? Man. Thank God I'm not British. That British major was saved. He was a Bible reader. And when he's reading, he's hearing about where they're going to attack. He said, wait a minute. He called his commanding officer. And he went to First Samuel 6, uh, 14. He said, look here. We are fighting right where they were. He said, there ought to be two columns of stone out there. And, and he said, here's what happened. And the commander went out and they found the two pillars. And the British sent a, a, a unit straight up the same way that, that uh, Jonathan, his armor bearer, when they got to the top, they found a piece of ground, about a half an acre of ground, like a, like a yoke of oxen would plow. And they attacked the, the Turks. And the, and the Turks broke and ran and the attack the next day didn't have to take place because they beat him because of that book, because of this man. He didn't know he was winning a victory 2,000 years in the future. That's character. They did something that was indispensable. That widow woman saved a prophet. I'm going to give you guys something. I know you preachers will get this down. You preachers will remember what I'm going to tell you, and you will share this with your church as soon as you get back. You know, I don't know if we're going to fall into a, a, a civil war or a depression or our dollar's going to collapse or somebody's going to pop a nuke up there and destroy all of our, you know, with ECM, they're going to destroy all of our computers. I don't know. But uh, anybody remember why he Remember why to January 1st, 2000, the computers were going to fail. The lights were going to go out. The water would stop. The Russians were going to fire their missiles. Your mother-in-law was going to move in. <laughs> Every horrible thing in the country was going to happen. And you remember all those godly people, and they, they blamed it on Joseph. Well, this is the Joseph principle. He was putting stuff. Yeah, but he wasn't going to shoot anybody that came for a bologna sandwich. Guys, people always worry about if the country goes down, how am I taken care of? You know what I tell church members? If you're a church member, listen very closely. You think, you think this is a preacher. You think this is a preacher trying to be taken care of. No, sir. But the only two, there's only two kinds of disasters. Natural and man-made. Right? Natural like what? Earthquake, famine, flood. Right? Uh, man-made like war, war, war. I find, I find two places where people got delivered from one, a natural calamity, and the other, a, a war situation. That widow lady, that was a natural disaster, was it not? And she didn't even have enough to get through the day, let alone the whole three and a half years. You know how she survived? What little she had, she, she took care of a man of God. That slave was about to watch Jerusalem be overrun by the Babylonians, and, and everybody was going to be carried off into captive, and he was scared to death that it was going to happen, wasn't he? Look at this. Go back to Jeremiah for a second. I just want to show you something. Jeremiah chapter 38. Yeah, he was afraid. Now look at verse chapter 39. And look at verse 15. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the prison, saying, Go and speak to Abim, uh, uh, Ebedmelech, the Ethiopian, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will bring my words upon this city for evil. Ooh, that's not good, guys. And not for good. And they shall be accomplished in that day before thee. 
I mean, that's what this guy's afraid of, right? But I will deliver thee in that day, saith the Lord, and thou shalt not be given into the hand of the men, but what it says, of whom thou art afraid. The only two people that were delivered, one from a natural calamity and the other from a military fiasco, both of them took care of a man of God. My pastor is here. Preacher, are you here? Stand up. This, this is my pastor. This is Brother Rick and Michael, pastor of Treasure Valley Baptist Church. Thank you, preacher. I am a member of his church. If a natural disaster comes, or if a war situation comes, I'm not going to sit around saying, I'm a man of God, so I'm going to take care of me. I'm a church member. I'm going to try to take care of him. And I'm not even going to do it because I want to be get through this thing, but I got news for it. That beats, you know, the bunker in your backyard and, you know, 25 years of freeze-dried pizza and 30,000 rounds of ammunition. So what happened? This guy brings two military victories. She takes care of a man of God. Four lepers saved all of Israel. He bed Malay. Saved him and his family. There was a slave in Virginia before the Civil War days. And he was working for his master, and out in the field, the master wanted to open up a new field, but there was a huge rock. I mean, a huge rock. One of those big... And he told his slave, you got to get that rock out of that field. He says, sir, that, we're not getting that rock out. And he says, you know what? I think if that rock gets split, we can, in half, we can haul the two halves. And here's what the master said to that slave. You split that rock, you're a free man. That slave would work the fields for his master. And then, instead of going home and resting, every night he'd walk out there with a sledgehammer. People all around the county would see him out there. He's just trying to get some kind of a crack. They could put a wedge in there and drive that wedge in there and break that rock. And he would wail on that rock. He's trying to get one little crack. And he would wail on that rock and wail on that rock. People thought he's nuts. He says, no, I'm going to be free. And you know what happened? He said, the rock split. No, the Civil War happened. The Civil War happened. It ended. The South lost. Guys, the South lost. Okay. Anyway, um, just, you know, there might be somebody that doesn't know yet. Um, and that slave was a free man. And one day somebody went by that field where he used to work. There he stood with that sledgehammer. He wailing on that rock. Somebody walked out there and said, what are you doing? He said, my master said, if I broke this rock, I'd be a free man. So you're already a free man. I'll never be free till that rock cracked. One day, that rock cracked. And he took him away. And he drove that wedge between that rock and that rock split in half. And he said, now I'm a free man. He said, what is that? That's character. What did these three children do? Guys, wouldn't you like to win a president of the Lord? Come on. I mean, you heard a testimony uh, about a congressman, correct? What about it? What about it? What about the president of the United States? Look, go back to Daniel chapter three. I'm sorry for jumping back around your Bible, but this is the most you do it anyway. Daniel chapter three. You know the story. They were thrown into the uh, into the um, fiery furnace. Jesus Christ showed up, verse 25, and he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. You know, I always point this out. We Baptists, we talk about this, and we always think for sure God's going to stop before we go in the fire. He's going he's to take care of Hey, He didn't stop that. Because there's no glory to Him until we're in the fire. But they would not bend their knee to this false God. Look what it says. In verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Now this is that it just said, Bow down to me and worship me, or I'm going to throw you in a fire and I'm kill you, right? Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God well, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who had sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Watch this. Therefore, I make a decree. Wasn't it one of his decrees to put these guys in the fire? Now he's going to make another one. 
that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall, shall be cut to pieces, cut in pieces, and their house shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. I want you to know something. If those boys right outside that fire would have said, Okay, Nebuchadnezzar, we worship your image. They'd have lived. Right? And that king never would have got converted. Didn't they live anyway? But that king got, that king got converted. So I'm going to talk to you about, briefly, and I'll tell you what to do to get some character. Here's how I think people get character. Some of you, you like it. I'm not saying all you preachers, but, but guys, sometimes you like character. If you have ever found yourself saying, I should have done something, I should have said something, but I thought what it cost, that's because you have, you have no character. Let me tell you what instills character. Do what you should. Just do your duty. Now, some of this you don't have a problem with. Like, did anybody know here you're supposed to win people? Then go slow with it. Win people. Put out gospel track, all right? But get people saved. But I don't think I need to wear that out on you because I think you've got, I think you've got, I think you're heading the right direction on that. Does anybody here not know that we ought to be separated from this world? And that is, uh, that is really kind of an odd thing. You know, I've seen people, I, always, I think this, here's how I look at it, you know, uh, I just don't want to go to church and have my best clothes in a closet at home waiting for somebody's wedding or funeral or my job interview. I just think God's worth the best I got. But I don't think you guys need help on that one either. Now, I'll tell you two areas. Number one, self-sacrifice. You know what I see in Christianity today? Here's how, and some of you have seen it in your people. Here's how it basically is. Preacher, it is not fair that I should have to deny myself anything because of Jesus Christ. I shouldn't have to say no to myself about anything. Nobody wants to sacrifice anything. But guys, sometimes you've got to sacrifice something. You know, I don't call them contemporary churches. I really don't. You know what I call them? I call them, I call them Christian theme parks. But tell me the truth. That's not an insult. That's a description. Is it not entertainment with a Christian theme? And I have people say this about rock music. Well, I like that kind of music. I had a guy tell me that. I said, well, who said you should listen to the kind of music you like? I'm going to pose a question. I don't know the answer to it. I am not looking for the answer to it. I hope I die never finding the answer to this question. You know what the question is? I wonder if I still like the taste of beer. I was in the bar seven nights a week when I got saved. Before I got saved. Well, you got to have some convictions. After I got saved, I dropped back to six nights a week. But Here's what I'm telling you guys. I didn't quit drinking because I didn't like the taste anymore. I quit drinking because I was saved. I might still like the taste. Do you understand? But who said I should drink what I like the taste of? And who said I should listen to the music that I like? And who said I should dress the way I want? And who said I should watch what I want? And who said I should listen and see everything I want? Guys, come on, man. You're not holy yet. So you're going to have to sacrifice some things. Say no to yourself. And I'll give you this one, guys. Read the book. You think God would paint a picture you didn't want anybody to see? You think God would write a song you didn't want anybody to hear? Because some of you think you wrote a book you didn't want anybody to read. And if anybody ought to be reading it, it ought to be a man of God. I don't, you know, let me tell you, Pastor, something. A man in your church becomes a problem when he becomes one of two things. He either becomes more spiritual than his pastor, or he thinks he is. But is that not true? Well, he can't be more spiritual than me. Well, if he's reading his Bible and you're not reading yours, he's going to pass you up. Then you're going to preach something that is totally not in the Bible, but you had a scripture for it. I was talking to somebody just before the service, and I said the greatest sermon text in the Bible is John 11.35. Jesus wept. Oh man, preach anything. This week I'm going to preach Jesus wept because you didn't win enough soul. 
Next week I'm preaching, Jesus wept because you didn't give enough and we don't get built the building. Next week it's Jesus wept because you disagreed with God's anointed. Some of you guys just quit reading your Bible. You got to, you'll, you'll go the rest of your life on Jesus wept. And you're going to preach something that is really great, it's just not biblical, and then the guy that's in his Bible is going to come in your office and say, Preacher, what you just preached is contrary to what the Bible says. And you're going to say, That's not God's anointed. And you're going to have to kill the only person in the church who's spiritual. Say, so how, What am I supposed to do about that? Read your Bible. Now, I don't trap people. I, you know how you do that. So I say, you care about souls. Yes, we care about You really love souls. You don't want people to go, no, we don't want people to go to hell. How many of you witnessed to 150 people this week? You don't really care about them. That's how you do that. But I am going to trap you. I am going to trap you, and I'm telling you about it, and you're going to walk right into it, and you can't even stop it. I have you in my power. I'm going to ask you two questions. I'm going to hook you just like that. First question. Do you believe every word in the Bible God put in there? Do you believe God put every word in the Bible? Okay. Even if you don't, you won't say it out loud. Second thing, has God ever done anything in vain? Come on. No. no. You ever do anything in vain? You ever change a starter only find out it's cell phone? You ladies, when you read it in the cookbook, it didn't say burnt offering. When I was 14 years old, my buddy, his, his older sister, made something that she called fudge. That pulpit is soft. You couldn't cut this stuff with... I, you know what we did? We took a flat screwdriver and a hammer and we'd knock a piece off of it. You didn't mean to get that guy, you're losing them. I put a piece up right there just to pinch the thing and taking them. Had I not spit it out, it'd still be in there. A button would dissolve before this day. That was in vain. Well, it wasn't really in vain. She sold that recipe to a concrete plant in Massillon, Ohio, my hometown. If you ever visit Massillon, Ohio, look at the sidewalks. They're shiny brown. They don't chip, crack, peel, or fade in the sun. Yeah, all right. You've done things in vain. God never did anything in vain, right? Now, stop and think of what you just said. God put every word in the Bible. God never did anything in vain. Then if God put one word in the Bible that he did not expect all people, all Christians to read, he put that word in the Bible in vain. But don't we say this? Do we not tell a lost world when you don't take what Jesus Christ did on the cross, his death, his burial, and his resurrection, when they don't take it as the full payment for their sin, don't they make what Jesus Christ went through vain? Well, I got news for you, preacher. When you don't read every word of this book, you made him giving you every word an act of vanity. Just like a lost man makes the cross vain, we make the inspiration and preservation of that book vain. You mean I gotta read it? Yeah, a book you love, you know. What do I do when I get done? Read it again. You mean they're going to read it twice? Nope. You've got to read it three times and four times and five times. Well, I'm not going to count. You, know, you just read it to count. You know, I had somebody tell me that one time. I, I, somebody asked me how many times I read my Bible. I said, he goes, you're counting. I said, so what do you count? Golf strokes? Antlers? Attendance numbers? Grandchildren? Come on, what are you counting? Let me ask you, whatever you're counting, when you get to the other side, stand at the judgment seat of Christ and say, I got the ten pointer. The Lord's going to go, huh? No. Oh. I had 78, 9, 79 grandchildren. So? We had this many people in church. So? The Lord, I read my Bible this many times. That book I sent you, you read it? You actually read it? Guys, I, I write books. It's a blessing when you put a lot of work into a book and somebody says, I read your book. It was a blessing. Guys, this book isn't a blessing to you because you're not reading it. 
when I get done, I got to keep reading. You know why you got to read your Bible over and over and over and over and over again? You know why you read your Bible and read your Bible and read your Bible and read your Bible and read? You know why? Because I like to kiss my wife. Yeah, man. We've been married 46 years. I don't know how many times I've kissed that woman, but not enough. I haven't kissed her yet, Rowan. Okay. Diana. That is enough of that, right? And shake from here on out. You know why you read the Bible over and over and over and over and over? Because I like steak. We call that celebrating the death of a cow. I like cattle. You're sick. Hey, come on, guys. Stop and think about this. Stop and think about this. We, because we are carnal and He is spiritual, we don't always line up with God, right? I, I, I found one place in the Bible, me and God are right on the same page. Hallelujah. Genesis chapter 4, they had the first dinner on the ground. Cain brought the salad. <laughs> Abel brought the meat. And God didn't want no part of that salad. When I read that, when I read it after I got saved, I said, I am going to like this God. <laughs> you keep reading your Bible because I like steak. If you want, I've had some good steaks. I've had a couple of them where the animal died in vain, but I've had some good steaks. You know the steak I haven't had yet? The one where I said, okay, that's enough. Tofu from here on out. You mean I got to read the names? Yep. I can't prove this. I can't prove this, but it will not surprise me when we get to heaven. If when the Lord was inspiring this book, when he got the Chronicles, he just took a bunch of Scrabble pieces and said, put that in. That'll keep them busy right there. You know, guys, I, I got a preacher friend. You know how he reads Chronicles? He says this, and Butch begat Butch. And Butch begat Butch, and Butch begat Butch. And I think that's one of the funniest things I've ever heard. That's not what it says. You say, you try to say his name? Yeah, I try to say his name. How do you know you're saying him right? How do you know you're saying him wrong? I'm not going to read Chronicles out loud on a street corner, okay? And if I did say him wrong, you wouldn't know. You know why I read Chronicles? You know why I try to say the names? Tell me if, if I'm not talking to somebody just like this. Guys, I'll tell you something. i got my problems. you got yours. But I'm going to tell you, I love the Lord Jesus Christ. I love Him. I love the God of creation. Now, I am trying the best I can to serve Him, to give Him some kind of honor and glory and to please Him in some way. If there's somebody in here like that, while you've been trying, I'm not talking about somebody that presents themselves to be holy then runs around the corner and lights up a cigarette. I'm talking about somebody who, in every way, they're trying to, trying to turn their life into something, not that people would look at, but that God would say, that pleases me. You understand? And while I'm trying that, I dropped the ball. I call it hurting him by accident. You ever hurt him by accident? Your humanity, your flesh just got in the way. That's why I say the names. I say the names the best I can. You say, why? Because I think he deserves a laugh. You know what I envision going on in heaven when I'm reading Chronicles? I, I see this. I'm down there stumbling over those. How could you? I mean, you say some of them names out loud, somebody's going to say, Because then I. And I'm down there trying to say the name my best I can, and I, here's what I see going on in heaven God going. Mike, Gabe, I, you guys got to hear this. I am God. I know everything. And I never thought that those letters in that order would make that sound right there. You know what you do? You read that book. When you get done, you read it again. When you get done, you read it again. You say, when can I quit? There's two valid excuses for not reading the Bible. <laughs> Some of you are looking real hopeful right now. Death and the rapture. You need to read that book. I tell people this. I, look, if you've got a Bible reading program that puts you through every word of the book, keep reading. Just keep doing what you're doing. If you have not been reading your Bible, let's give, let me just give you one. Proverb a day, ten pages. I didn't say chapters, ten pages. Page one, from page one to page ten. Next day, page twenty. Next day, page thirty. Next day, page forty. I got my friend right there, Joe Sylvester. Joe and I grew up one house away from each other, two Roman Catholic boys. Went to St. Joe's Roman Catholic Church, going to hell together. I got saved. Joe got saved. Not long ago, Joe wrote me, because I got him on the King James Bible. He said, thanks for giving me my Bible. I just finished my 127th time through the book. 
My wife just finished, what, 156, though? Is that it? Oh, you're counting. Sure am. But you count. I'm telling you, you need to read this book and read this book and read this book and read this book and read this book. You say, I read and didn't get nothing from it. That's what gives you character. You did what you should and got nothing for it. And just in doing that, you got something from it because you did what you should and got nothing from it. We need character. I didn't say, I didn't say you do. I said we. You know why? Because trying times may be coming. You know what I don't want to do? I don't want to embarrass this guy. I don't want to stand identified with his name and then fail and fail. I don't want to be outdone. I, look, I don't mind Jonathan. I don't mind being shown up by Jonathan. I don't want to be shown up by no widow woman. A bunch of lepers, a slave, a bunch of kids. But they had something that some of us lack. I'll tell you this and I'll be done. There's a man buried not far from here. I went to his grave just after he was buried. This happened. I was back in the 80s. I was at another. Brian's Road. Is there a Brian's Road? We had a meeting at Camp Meeting in Brian's Road back in like 85, maybe 87, 89. I can't remember what it was. I went there for quite a few years in a row. And the man's name is James Nicholas Rowe. James Nicholas Rowe was a Green Beret in the U.S. Army in the Vietnam days. James Nicholas Rose from North Carolina, and you know what he said? He said, I just can't let this thing go. I've got to get in the Army and do this battle. So he joined the Army, and he ended up being in special forces. that We, we know them as the Green Berets. And in 1963, when he was in, they actually were advisors. They would put four Green Berets. They put them in with a company of, of South Vietnam Army. Now, if you know anything about the Vietnam War, if you look at my hand, all right, see that right there? That's the, that's the DMZ. This is North Vietnam. This is South Vietnam. The South Vietnam Army had two enemies. They had the NVA, the North Vietnamese Regular Army, that would cross that border and wage war. They had to fight these guys. But here, they had communists amongst themselves. They went by AOC. Oh, no, I'm sorry. sorry. They, They went by Viet Cong. Those were South Vietnamese that were communists, and they had to fight them. In October 1963, the company, the South Vietnamese company that James Nicholas Rowe and his son, the three Special Force guys, were, were advising, got overrun. One of the Green Braves was captured. Rowe and two others, or one of them was killed, and Rowe and two others were captured. And he said this. He said, uh, by the way, the, well, I'll tell you the name of the book in a moment, but... Um, he said, when I got captured, I wasn't worried about it. He said, I really wasn't bothered. He said, the Viet Cong had captured three other Green Berets, kept them for three months, and then a good faith gesture had, had turned them loose. And he said, I figure three months, four months, six months maybe, and they'll turn us loose. Five months? Five years. The book is called Five Years to Freedom. He was, he was being held. Now, you guys know about the Mississippi River, down where it goes into the Gulf of Mexico. They have the Mississippi Delta, and it's all swamp. Well, that's how the Mekong Delta is. And Roe and his fellow Green Berets were held down in the, in the Mekong Delta. They were prisoners. There wasn't, even a, there wasn't even a fence around. They just couldn't find their way out. You say, why didn't they escape? He did three times. Couldn't find his way out. He said the third time, funniest thing, he said the third time, he said, I knew I made it. And he said, I parted these bushes and I stepped through, here's a bunch of Viet Cong around a campfire. And he said, they looked at me and I looked at them. Man thought fast. He said, uh, could you help me, guys? Uh, I'm a prisoner of war uh, and, uh, and I'm being held. I was out in firewood and I got lost. Could you help me go find my camp again? They took him back. Then you know he escaped. But he was held for five years and could have gone home anytime he wanted. Any time he wanted. All he had to do was sign a letter. Oh, it would say something along the line of, I'm a U.S. soldier, and the war that the United States is waging against uh, the Vietnamese people is an is a illegal war, and I'm a war criminal, and I ask the Vietnamese people to I apologize to them, I ask them to forgive me. They go home anytime they wanted. But he refused to sign that letter. 
He said they didn't torture us. He said if we were bad, they just took our mosquito netting away for a few days. He said, he said in a place that big on my arm, I counted over 100 mosquito nets. He was 190 pounds when he was captured. Five years later, he was 120 pounds. He said he had dysentery for five years. I had a preacher friend of mine who said, if you ever had dysentery, you thank God for diarrhea. He had dysentery for five years. He said he had a black mold that grew all over his body. And he said, we, 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 we just kept on going. He said, the worst thing that happened to us is one of the guys. He said, they, they catch some other guys. There's never more than four of them at a time. And he said, all of a sudden, one of the guys would lose the will to live. He said he quit eating. He said, guys, we're never getting out of here. We're never going to see home again. I'll never see my wife. I'll never hold my children. And he said he just, he just stopped living, stopped eating, and he died. And he said, when that would happen, the three of us would be around his bed. And we said, no, listen, listen, this war will be over one of these days. You will go home. You will see your wife. You will see your children grow up. Just stay with it. Stay with it. Fight, fight. And he said, if they got it, they got through that, and they lived. And he said, if they didn't get it, they just died. He said, one day, the other three that were with him were called up to the, 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 the main house where the, where the camp guy was running it. And he said, they were up there for a couple hours, and he said, then they, they had me come up, and he said, I walked in, here's his three fellow prisoners, he said, hi. And the, and the head of the camp said, you can't talk to them anymore. He said, what do you mean I can't talk to them? He said, they're my fellow prisoners, we're your prisoners here. He said, no, 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 you're the prisoner. They're going home tomorrow. All three of them signed the letter. You know who picked them up the very next day? Tom Hayden. Tom Hayden, the communist that married Hanoi Jane Fonda. Now, here's what Rose said. He said, when I was first captured, I thought, the army will not let me down. They will rescue us. But they never came. They never came. And he said, okay. He said, he said, then he said, halfway through there, or he said, right around 1966 and 67, they used to make them listen to Hanoi Hannah, kind of like the Tokyo Road, the Vietnam War. And he said, around 1967, they quit having her listen to her. And we listened to the anti-war things going on in our own colleges. He said, wait a minute, the army betrayed me and abandoned me. Now the country I'm fighting for abandoned me. He said, by the time these three guys were released, he said, we had a pretty good idea where we were. And we've made a pact that if any one of us ever got out, we would call in a rescue. And he said, the way you know the rescue is going to come, they had a, they, they had a little spotter plane. It was just a Cessna. They called an 01 bird dog. And he said, just before, about a half an hour before that rescue, uh, an old one will fly over the camp and he'll cut the engine off. And then he'll turn it back on, he'll cut it off again. And then he'll turn it back on. He said, if that old one flies over the camp, you hear it cut his engine twice. He said, just go into the jungle. Just walk into the jungle. And he said, he said, the bombs will drop and a helicopter will come in and you jump on a helicopter. Come on home. He said, they disappeared. And he said, I waited for days and I waited for weeks. And he said, I'd hear an old one fly over the top. And he said, I'd listen to he cut the engine. No, he didn't cut the engine. But he, when he cut no, he didn't cut the engine. He said, after about two months, I realized my army abandoned me. My country abandoned me. And my fellow prisoners abandoned me. Now he is the only single American prisoner that they told him. They said, you think you'll go home when this is over? We'll keep you a long time after this war is over. You know what he said? You, you guys who are in the military, you'll understand this. He said, all I had left when everybody had abandoned me, he said, all I had was my military code of conduct. You know what that is? I, guys, I, I don't mean any, I don't mean any uh, disrespect, but basically, isn't that just some words on a piece of paper? Now, here's a man who is not home. He wants to be home. Do you understand? And everybody has abandoned him. And all he's got is some words on a piece of paper. And I thought, wait a second. I'm not home. I am in the middle of enemy territory. And all I got is some words on a piece of paper. And I said, I think I can relate to this right here. One thing he had kept from them the five years he was prisoner, one thing he kept from them, they did not know that he could understand and read Vietnamese. 
So he became a model prisoner. Oh, I'll sweep the office out for you. He'd be sweeping the office. He'd look at the, the commandant's desk. He'd read almost everything that's on there. And he said, one day, my blood ran cold. I saw a piece of paper. I saw my name on it. I looked at the letterhead. It was from North Vietnam. And they said, send Rowe, Lieutenant Rowe, send him up north. He said, I knew if I went north, I'd never get home. He said, I have got to escape now. I have got to get out of here. He said, well, I was trying to think. Now, guys, it's not 1963, but now it is 1968. And the, and the U.S. has got a quarter million troops in Vietnam, and the war is at its peak. And he said, well, I was trying to think how I was going to escape. He said, all of a sudden, I was awakened by the sound of 500 and 250 pound bombs impacting that compound. Because now they're trying to destroy all of those camps in the Mekong Delta. He said they obliterated our camp. Now, you understand, this guy was an American that weighed 190 pounds at one time in a U.S. Army uniform. Now he's 120. He's tanned, and he's wearing black pajamas like everybody else. And he said they bombed us. They chased us for three days. We abandoned that camp. And he said the U.S. Army chased us for three days. They machine gunned us. They bombed us. They're trying to kill me. And he said we got into a field of elephant grass. He said, two U.E. gunships were working that field. Every time they saw something moving, they'd come and they'd shoot it. They thought, I have got to get those guys' attention so I can get out of here. And it wasn't really too hard because they're walking in column, and he's the next to the last guy. The whole camp is ahead of him, all the Viet, Viet Cong. Then there's him, and then there's his guard. He said, it was real easy, so I just started walking slow. And he said, pretty soon everybody walked ahead of us. Because my guys watch, And he said, and he had made a pass. And he said, my guard looked up there. He said, I picked up a tree limb. And he said, I laid him down. He never got up. He said, then I beat down that, and that elephant grass. He said, I beat down an area about eight foot square. He said, a Huey gunship flew over. Then he said, I waved to him. And he said, I looked right into the pilot's eyes, the co-pilot's eyes. They saw me. And he said, when they passed over me, he said, they started doing a 360 degree turn to come back and get me. He said, I am going home. They are coming to get me. But he could not understand standing down there. He could not hear what was going on in that helicopter. But the co-pilot said to the pilot, there's one. What are we going to do? And the pilot began to pull that 360. He said, next pass, I'm going to gun him. He goes to Viet Cong. He was watching hope. He was watching that helicopter come around to pick him up. It was coming around to kill him. He didn't even know it. That, that pilot said, he put those crosshairs right on James Nicholas Rowe. Put his hand on the trigger for that for that gun, and just before he pulled the trigger and blew Rowe into eternity, from a thousand feet up in another helicopter, the lieutenant colonel that was over that whole operation said, "Don't shoot him, capture him. I want a prisoner to interrogate." That pilot pulled collective, and he said he dropped down. He said, "As they're coming down, one of the door gunners said, this is an American.'" He said they picked me up. And he said, they slid me on the floor of that Huey helicopter. He said, that pilot pulled the, poured the kerosene, those two jet engines. And he said, I felt myself being lifted off the earth. Oh, uh, yeah. That's kind of what I'm waiting for. Aren't you, being, aren't you waiting to be airlifted out? Here we are in the middle of enemy territory. Everybody has abandoned us. All we got is some words on a piece of paper, and I want to be airlifted out. But it wasn't over. Pilot looked back over his shoulder and said, Who are you? He said, I'm Lieutenant James Nicholas Rowe, U.S. Army Special Force. Pilot got on the radio, spoke to somebody for a few minutes, turned back, looked Rowe right in the eye, and said, No, you're not. He said, I'm Lieutenant James Nicholas Rowe, United States Army Special Force. No, you're not. I am Lieutenant James Nicholas Rowe, United States Army Special Forces. I've been a POW for five years, sir. You're not Lieutenant James Nicholas Rowe. You're Major James Nicholas Rowe. He had been promoted from Lieutenant to Captain to Major and didn't even know it just because he stayed in. You getting this yet? They got to the base. He got off that helicopter, and here he stands amongst a bunch of army green with black pajamas wearing the enemy's uniform. And one of these guys said, this will never do. And he ran off to the quartermaster, came back with a brand new army issue. And he said, he, he said I stripped down right there on the, air, on, the, on the airfield and put on them new clothes. I said, yeah, if I got this right, when I get there, I'm getting a robe of righteousness. There was a major there, took the collar, took his major insignia, pinned him right there. 
He said, and then we went to the mess hall. He gave it a whole new reason to be called mess. He said, if it didn't move, I ate it twice. I thought, yeah. I think after we get there and we get that robe, aren't we going to have us a feast, a marriage supper of the Lamb? And he said, I'm in the hospital. I'm in the infirmary. They're trying to get my health back. He said, one day this really sharp Lieutenant Colonel, you know, you guys in the military, you know, they always look. He said, this guy looked like his shirts were ironed on him, man. He said, this Lieutenant Colonel walked in. He had a briefcase, sat me down at the table, opened up this briefcase, took out a letter with U.S. Army uh, uh, letterhead on it, took a pen out and said, here you go, here you go, Major, just sign right there. He said, I picked up the pen. I'm about to sign this. He's got this pen in his hand. He said, I'm about to sign this. And he said, yeah, what am I signing here? He said, uh, that's a waiver of your civil rights for your court martial. He said, what? He said, oh, don't worry, Major. He said, it's just formality. I don't know if you realize, but every single prisoner of war, every American prisoner of war, when they come back, they have to stand before a, a court martial review just to see. Now, think about this. This guy was in the jungle all by himself. But if he broke the words on that piece of paper, he's going to catch up with him right there at that judgment. He said, it's just for now, Major. Rose said, you understand, sir. He said, I was a POW for five years because I wouldn't sign something that wasn't true. And he said, I wouldn't sign it for them. I'm not signing it for you. He said, Major, trust me. He said, you got to sign it. you got to have the review. He said, I'm not doing it. Get out of here. He said, he said Major, you'll sign it. Just call me when you're ready. Now, I'm going to tell you this. I, I, I hate to have to say this. I can't believe I have to say this. Please do not laugh at what he, what he said. Because I tell people what he said to my chuckles. But here's why he decided to sign it. He said, if I sign this and they send me to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, military prison for something I did, you know how bad it's going to be? He said, I'll have three meals a day. You know what he had to eat the day he was rescued? A half a cup of uncooked rice and a half a cup of rock salt. And he said, if they send me to Leavenworth, Kansas, military prison, I'll have three meals a, door, a day and an indoor toilet. He said, that's pretty high living. Called that Lieutenant Colonel said, bring your letter. He signed it. Signed his life off. They stood him up in front of a court-martial board of, of fellow officers. They listened to the last five years of his life. They put their heads together. When it was over, they looked at him and they said, no charges. They said, yeah. I'm going to get airlifted out. I'm going to get, I'm going to get the, the new robe of righteousness. I'm going to get the marriage stuff to the Lamb. I'm going to have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You know what he was doing when I read the book? Some of you guys have been in the military. You've heard of, you've heard of SEER, S-E-R-E, Survival, Evasion, Resistance, and Escape. That never existed until James Nicholas did. And he developed that, and at the time he wrote his book, he was reigning over that portion of the army. I say, yeah, you know what? If during this little time when I'm a POW, when I'm so far away from home, and I just want to go home and all, I just don't violate these words on a piece of paper. I get a chance to rule over something. He died, I think it was 1987, 88, 89, right in there. He went to the Philippines and taught the Filipino army out of with the communists, and they did it. He was assassinated by the communists. He's over in Arlington, and I came home one day. My wife, and she knew what I think of him. She said, she told me, she said, James Nicholas Rose being assassinated. I cried. I cried. I happened to be in that meeting, and I said, we've got to go to Arlington. You want to go see Kennedy? Go see Kennedy. You want to see somebody else? Go see somebody else. I said, I want to find out where that man's buried. It was just still a pound, a, a, a mound of dirt and a little brass plaque because they hadn't put up any headstone yet. Lieutenant Colonel. James Nicholas Rowe, U.S. Army Special Force, former P.O. Dunn. Say, what was it? In a word, character. I believe this guy. I believe this. I believe there isn't one person in here that wants to shame our Savior. 
I don't believe there's one of you people that want to fail him. I don't. Want, I don't think you want to embarrass him. But I'm going to tell you, it's not. It's not this. I'm going to be macho. You know what it's going to take? It's going to take some character. And some of you are be honest enough to say, I don't think I have enough. And go win some souls. Then, 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 then separate yourself from that world. Then sacrifice for this God and read this book and read this book and read this book until you die. Oh, you hear a real loud trumpet. And pray God give you some character so that you can at least do as good as a widow or a handful of lepers or a slave. That's real sin. Don't you, you don't want to be outdone by You don't mind being outdone by Jonathan, do you? But then, Mother, you want to be outdone by him? You know what I don't want to do? Oh, look, I'm not talking about pride. I don't, I don't, I don't mean I'm going to stand there and say, look what I did for God. I just want to get there. I want to say this. You didn't fail me, buddy. You didn't fail me. You stood with me and you just stand. And I'm going to tell you what it's going to do. It's going to be this love for God. Because some of you have not stood for him and you love him. But you lack the character. That's what forged our nation. That's what made these people. Who was the common denominator. And it is the common denominator of every great person in history. It was their character. Because character, you just can't hide it. It stands out. It's going to show itself. Some of you tonight need to say, Dear God in heaven, give me some of the character that widow will have. Give me the character of four unclean lepers. Give me the character of that Ethiopian. Give me the character of those children. Give me the character of a lieutenant colonel of Dave Nichols. I'd like you to stand with your heads bowed. Your heads bowed, your eyes closed. In just a moment, I'm going to have a word of prayer when the 